The only people for me are the mad ones. The world is filled with the boring and the barely conscious. The misery loves company. But we don't have to live this way. Jessica and I are here to talk to those the system rejects, to radicals and thought criminals. The ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but push the boundaries of acceptable discourse. Those who stare reality in the face and dare it to be different. History isn't made by the timid, and fun is not had by the perpetually afraid. We are the mad ones. So let's get to it. Welcome to the Mad Ones. I am your extremely erudite and handsome host, Cam Harless. And usually I say at this point with me, as always, is your well-read, truth-seeking, and also handsome hostess, Miss Jessica Green. But unfortunately, just right before we started the show, her internet started hiccuping really bad. And so we're hoping that we can get that figured out and she can pop back in. Uh, but as for right now, uh, I'm going to be introducing our guest and starting the conversation up. So any questions that you have for our guest, make sure to throw them in the comments and uh, we can get those nice and, and answered for you. Um, so before we get to that, let's talk about a couple of our sponsors. You saw them at the beginning. Uh, you should check out, I know that Scott will appreciate this because he calls himself a coffee aficionado. Uh, there's a coffee brand called Run Your Mouth Coffee, rymcoffee.com, and they have a bourbon barrel aged coffee that I love. And if you go to rymcoffee.com and use promo code the mad ones, you can get 10% off your order. And it helps us, helps them, helps you get up in the morning. Uh, we also are, uh, we also have the uh, Righteous Felon Beef Jerky Crew. So if you go to RighteousFelon.com and check out any of their beef jerkies, all of them that I've tasted have been good. Uh, you can go to RighteousFelon.com, promo code MADONES, no the on the front of that, and you can get 10% off your order there. Uh, before we get started, hit like and subscribe if you haven't already. It helps us out. So let's go ahead and do that. But to get past all of that, all of that's over. You don't have to hear it anymore. Uh, I, joining us tonight is a man whose primary job is to lead sheep, the sheep back home, and his side hustle you'll be most familiar with if you watch horror movies. He's a husband, a father, a minister, a writer, a lover of coffee, a demonologist, and a modern-day exorcist, Mr. Scott Johnson. How you doing, Scott? <laughs> I am better than I deserve. How are you? I'm, I'm doing okay. I thought it was I thought it was funny because, you know, we kind of bro- spoke briefly right before this about how we need to talk about spiritual warfare because a lot of people are coming to the understanding and the knowledge that what we're fighting right now is not physical. It's, it's spiritual. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. And right before that, all of a sudden for the first time ever, Jessica's internet is the worst I've ever seen. Like she couldn't chew a piece of popcorn without being frozen and everyone, or just you and I seeing her, uh, what we call the poop face. Uh, <laughs> so unfortunate but you you actually said that that happens every time you try to do a show there are technical difficulties like this and yeah. so uh, yeah i do think it's spiritual warfare uh but there have been a lot of people who've been very interested in this um in this episode because you know we've had some people kind of come along with us uh in recent months and kind of have uh kind of seek out more spiritual things particularly christian things and so they are interested in what's going on in the spiritual realm. Last week we talked to Cody Cook and we talked to our friend Ryan about the divine council and you know, the kind of the the whole uh, subject of Cody Cook's book, uh, Fight the Powers. And he had pointed me to you and I was like, this guy actually does exorcisms. So I know that it can't be just like it is in the movie The Exorcist. So let's talk about what that really looks like. Um, but before we get to the meat and potatoes, um, I did want to kind of start with your kind of history, who you are, et cetera, kind of your journey from uh, wherever you started to demonologist and uh, fighting fighting the devil. So mm-hmm. if you, if you'd like to give us a you know a a summary of that kind of where you came from, that'd be that'd be awesome. I am woefully inadequate. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but that's true. Um, 
No, um, let's see. I was born in West Virginia, uh, grew up there, and um, I was, my parents were in and out of, of church, and that's no fault. I have no blaming of them. I just, I, I didn't jive with it. So, like, uh, I didn't become a Christian until I was 19. Um, so I was an atheist. Uh, I was a very heavy drug user, drug mm. seller, um, you know how I made it through high school and college and, and not die. Um, no idea. Uh, grace of God, really. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was a terrible, wretched human being um, hmm. and didn't believe in God. One day I was in my Western Civ class in college, community college. Some girl I didn't know randomly hands me a birthday present. It just happens to be my birthday. I was like, that's strange. I go home back to my parents' house because that's what I'm doing, you know, with my life. And <laughs> um, I open the book and I see it's about Jesus. And so I throw it in the trash can. Um, hmm. Like, not today. So I lay down on the couch, take a nap. Uh, I feel very compelled to get up, pull that book out of the trash. It's the book, The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren. Um, and inside it says, Scott, I hope this leads you where God wants you to go. So this girl I never knew. Um, it knows my birthday, knows my name. This is before Facebook, anything like that. Mm. Uh, I read that book through in one night. The next day I found a Bible. I read the Gospel of John. And like that, um, I knew what I was supposed to do with my life. I repented. I was baptized. I got involved with the local church. And I started Bible college about a month later. Uh, completed my degree. And I've been in ministry for uh, 15 plus years. Well, and, and that's so. what's what's cool is some of the people that I've talked to lately, I've I'm I'm going to and I'll I'll pitch it here because I haven't pitched it wide, uh, but John is like the best book for newcomers when it comes to reading the Bible, at least in my opinion. Like you know, Matthew, me too. Matthew is written to a specific audience. Mark, Luke is very technical, but then you hit John, and it's like this is the guy who's like, hey, I'm the one Jesus loved, and so it's that very passionate, good good energy for someone who's just delving into Christianity, just delving into the story of Jesus. And so anyone who hears this and thinks, Hey, I want to uh, study the Bible some more. I'm going to start a, a little hangout. We can determine where at a later date, but we'll, we'll, we'll walk through John together, read it, talk about it. So if you're interested in that and you're listening, hit me up on Twitter. That's the best way to connect with me. And I'll give you further details once I figure them out. So, how do you so you went from atheist to reading the purpose driven life, which I, I read like years and years ago? Was that was oh, that yeah. a really impactful book for you? I or had was never just the beginning, yeah. Like, I mean, I look at it now, and you know, some of the theology in it and, and, and things I'm not really fond of, but it was the perfect thing that I needed because I had never heard about Jesus and the way Rick Warren in that book points him out as the loving God, you know. I just had a very different opinion of God. So I think it was just a, a whole providence thing and God looking out. It was the right thing at the right time and right where I needed it. Yeah. Um, and so uh, did you, you, so you have a bachelor's degree or did you go full on master's degree with the, the theology? I have a bachelor's degree. Hey, same. we're in the same boat with that. But I I'm didn't not, become I'm a not, pastor. I don't, I don't like learning. <laughs> uh, well, you kind of are. I mean. Yeah, I, sort of. We'll, we'll get there. I'm working on it. Um, Super digital I now. Yeah, I, I definitely am to my children. Uh, but That's the um, most important people. I think so, yeah. Besides my wife, yeah. Um, but uh, so how do you, out of college, you go, did you go straight into a church and start working as probably a youth pastor? Because that's typically where they, they, they start people. They test them on the youth. I was a camp <laughs> campus minister. Um, I worked at a very small church um, in Cincinnati. I was the campus minister at Cincinnati State. I had campus ministry at the University of Cincinnati and Xavier University. Um, I was there for about five and a half years. Um, also did youth group. Um, also did every other thing that church ministers do, like cut the grass and you know <laughs> check check out the alarms in the really sketchy area of town at night. I'm the one who gets to go in and see why the alarms busted. So, but, you know, it was a catch all, but it was awesome. I always thought it was funny though, but um, I was thinking about this several months ago. The fact that uh, a lot of times when pastors come in, they're like, you're not good enough for the, for the, um, 
for the adults yet. Let's try you out on the on the youth and let's see how you do. As if that's not like a very important time. <laughs> well, it's like you're not a real minister right now, but maybe you will be. Right. It's just such a bizarre idea. Um, so what what took you from there to exorcism and learning about that and learning about demons? And then we can delve into the the experiences and all of that. So really like so I left the campus ministry job after five and a half years and came to my current um, church that I serve at in Middletown, Ohio. And I've been here this March. It'll be my 10th year. Um, okay. So uh, a couple years into this, like uh, just some, just my curiosity peaked on this issue and a lot of things kind of happened to get my attention into this realm. Um, I've always had an interest even before I was a Christian in supernatural things and paranormal stuff and horror movies and, you know, all that stuff. I played with Ouija boards when I was a non-Christian, which is a big no, no. And we'll yeah. talk about that in a while. Don't do that. Um, so, so do not do that. I, I will be the person to tell you not to. Um, but it, it just, um, it's something that God unfolded very gradually over time and introduced again, like the purpose driven life, the right things at the right time in the right place with the right people. Gotcha. Um, and, and so I became a friend acquainted with a guy that um, was a Orthodox. He was a Catholic that turned Orthodox priest. And now I don't think he's Catholic anymore. Um, I don't have a lot of contact with him. I don't know, but he was an exorcist and, um, Taught me a lot of good stuff. Um, had a lot of really good discussions with him. Great classes, great instruction and mentoring. I, I forever treasure that. And then I just kind of went on my own. Huh. What did the What did those classes look like? It was like, really how, how just did... like this in in a coffee shop. It was our Bibles, um, some tapes, some videos, um, some anecdotal evidence of firsthand encounters, and then some of the traditional you know, church practices and theology around this issue. Uh, so it was, it was really casual, which are like, and it involved coffee. So we're good. Well, coffee's always, I, I, I have uh, been a barista at more than one uh, coffee shop. I think three, three technically. Wow. So, I mean, I, I, I appreciate coffee. Uh, if, if you haven't tried that coffee I mentioned, you need to, because it smells like heaven and it tastes even better. Sweet. So it did, I, it, I was, I was watering, salivating at this bourbon <laughs> coffee. Oh man. I'm a, I, I am a big fan of bourbon and I, I love coffee. So it's like, that's a match made in heaven for me. Yeah. Um, so when you went through, uh, these, these class or the, these conversations in these classes, did, did he, you said he was Catholic. Was there a lot of conversation about how, what he'd been through or what to look for? Like, Easiest way to ask it, when you're talking about exorcism, uh, what are you looking for when you decide that someone needs to be exercised besides, you know, their waistline, the other kind of I was just about to make that joke. <laughs> uh, um, so. Hey, guys. I think welcome. I'm. Hi. I think I managed to fix the problem. I, exor I exercise the demon. <laughs> I, I knew you could. Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to greet you or That's the okay. other guests. Where were we? Talking about exorcisms? Yeah. Talking okay. about uh, the, the, the basics. And uh, so you, someone comes to you and says, uh, you know, I, I feel like I have demonic influence. I feel like I'm possessed or their, their mother does, uh, I, I would assume the first step would be like mental health assessment. Like, are you, are you, are you actually possessed or is this something physical or something like that? Like how, what, at what point do you go, okay, we need to start walking towards this more, um, what's the word formal way to get rid of this issue? Yeah. So just for the audience out front, just know this, like 99% of the people, that come seeking an exorcism are not legitimately having a spiritual problem, at least of the demonic type. Um, so I say that to say demonic possession in a human being is absolutely a, a very rare and well hidden phenomenon. Um, mm -hmm. 
So the first step, usually somebody comes and says, hey, I think, you know, this is going on. And, and usually it starts with like the property where they live, um, like your a haunted house or something. But, um, you know, it, it, it is the mental like, OK, what are your I, I do very detailed, extremely long questionnaires because my job is to be skeptical. Right. Um, like so mental health is really important. Um, and a lot of mental health issues can mimic symptoms uh, or mm -hmm. manifestations of demonic possession so closely that they are often confused and in history have been confused uh, mm -hmm. with actual possession. And so mental health and physical health are two things. If a person will not, and again, I'm not a counselor or psychologist or uh, I'm not a doctor or anything like that. So uh, my requirements are if you, um, if you, um, Let's, let's, if you come to me, I'm going to ask you to submit yourself to a physician and a psychiatrist um, because a lot of times those problems are weeded out within that context. Hmm. So that's like step one. And that could take months. So uh, Noah asks, I don't sometimes a mentally disturbed person is just a mentally disturbed person then? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and they need treatment. Um, they need possibly medication, they need therapy, and there's a whole host of things, um, that can happen. And so everybody is different. Everybody responds differently. Um, but usually I, I really require a lot of biological and psychological information because there's so many mm -hmm. environmental factors, physical factors, vitamin deficiencies, radon Gut in your house, health. uh, you know, gut health, maybe, are, are we about to sell like a vitamin out of your coat pocket here? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just saying that that's, that's, that's a <laughs> huge right. issue with a lot of it people's is. gut health. Mm -hmm. It is, it is because it, it really does contribute to your mental health balance. Um, and so there, there's all kind of issues that really can be usually ruled out um, at first glance. And usually I find if people genuinely are having a problem, those are the ones that will submit to that testing and go through with it very quickly, or they already have um, mm -hmm. in a search for trying to figure something out. It's the people who don't like to hear that, that you get most of the time. Yeah. Like, no, nah, there's nothing wrong with me. It's clearly the devil. It's like, okay, why? Well, because my left toenail fell off. So therefore I'm possessed. Um, <laughs> you know, those kind of things. Sometimes um, that's just drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. And so I'm sure sometimes it's just attention seeking too. Yes, unfortunately. So, so what's how your, many Sorry, I was going to say like what's your first tip off that something has gone beyond the realm of the physical and biological, the mental health aspect and you start to go, okay, we might be dealing with something spiritual here. Um sometimes that that can take a while there's not necessarily a defining moment until way later in this process of physical and mental examination that people go through. Um, sometimes that can pop out pretty quick. Um, there are you know, one, one thing that I've noticed in my experience that again, it's purely anecdotal evidence. I'm not a scientist or researcher compiling things and it's different, but it's just what I notice. a lot of times right. in the eyes um, there, there's a lot going on in the eyes of people. Um, okay that you can see. Um, yeah. And I kind of describe it. It's just how I have been able to verify a lot of things. You know, that's interesting because something that I um, noticed about pictures of Lenin um, from the Russian revolution is that he has this almost, um, I wouldn't call it a dead look because it's like his eyes are bottomless. Like there's no mm -hmm. pupil there. It's like, there's a portal to another dimension in there. And I remember we showed Maddie from Voluntary Vixens, the pic, the, one of the last pictures of Stalin alive, or not Stalin, I'm sorry, Lenin. And she was like, get that thing off of the screen. Just the sight of it like frightened her. And so I kind of mm -hmm. know what you're saying about the eyes because if anybody was possessed, it was Lenin. So um, yeah, I, I really can appreciate that. I It's very difficult to describe, but um, Mm -hmm. Would you say that, I don't know if you've seen those pictures yourself? Oh, yeah. You like have? World okay. leaders like that, like world yeah. leaders like that, like Hitler, 
Lennon, um, these kind of guys. Yeah, there's definitely like moments, not every picture, but there are ones you're like, whoa, like mm-hmm. there is something bad there. Yeah. Um, and so, so usually the eyes, there's a lot of things that happen. Like you have that black, like you were talking about it. It's like a portal. You're, 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 it's almost, almost like a mirror looking back at you, but it's, mm-hmm. it's like interdimensional or something. And it just feels terrible. Sometimes people's eyes are glossy, um, almost mm-hmm. like glaucoma. Sometimes the pupil actually changes shape. Um, sometimes their eyes are blood red. Um, mm-hmm. you know, that's a pretty easy one to tip off if your eyes are blood red and you haven't, you know, been smoking a doobie. Um, there are Might people who were in, interviewing Ted Bundy and he would get into these states where they said his the pupils in his eyes would literally change shape. And there was a mm. point during the courtroom proceedings where they were questioning him, where people in the courtroom remarked about the way that his pupils changed shape when he became mm-hmm. enraged or angry at the uh, the lawyer who was interviewing him. So, yeah, I think that there's been some like live witnessing to stuff like that going on for sure. Have you ever yeah, seen it is. while you're while you're watching like current political people on screen go, okay, that's some dark stuff. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Because like, mm-hmm. I feel like I have. <laughs> like uh, so I I would classify, you know, I don't like to I don't I used to be really into politics, but then like I stopped because it's terrible for you. Um Amen. but um I would I would classify myself as like an anarch anarchist Christian. I don't know what that even yeah. means. I'm just making stuff up. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, like you look into all these people's eyes and they all look dead. Uh like they all look there are some that are more sinister than others. Um, there are some that you're like, something just ain't right with you. Like there's yeah. uh, maybe you're on like a life support machine behind you, but you look like death warmed over and your eyes are. Terrible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was, there was one, one person in this last thing uh, when there actually, it was two people in two different um, debates and I was watching and one of the, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to be like partisan here, but one of the people in the debate, um, they, they had that black eye thing going on and the other person, they had these incredibly active, evil looking eyes like the way they darted the way and it was just like it's almost I, like primal right I'm, yeah. like, I'm not saying that there's a demon inside of you but i know that you're consorting right. with them right. yeah i, I don't want to like lead your audience to say if i can look in people's eyes i can tell i mean maybe but you know that's a good no, but i think but... even even to like the layman if you you've we've all experienced that before where we've run into a person and we've caught eyes with them and we've just known in our bones something's not right with you and it's not a mental health thing it's not a drug thing i've been around high people plenty this is something different and you don't have to have a particularly deep spiritual education i think to pick up on it i think there's an instinct in the human being that is like i gotta get away from this person have you ever thought about the uncanny valley do you know about do you know what the uncanny valley is oh yeah polar express (laughs) like the, the movie polar express or it's it's essentially uh characters or robots or whatever that are close enough to human but they're not they they're not close enough to actually look human so there's there's something about looking at them that deeply unnerves us and there's some scientists out there who are trying to figure out why that is and they were saying Mm -hmm. well the best explanation is that at some point in our history there was a predator that looked a lot like us but not quite like us that led to that uncanny feeling that uncomfortability that wanting to get away and of course when i hear that my brain automatically goes to like the nephilim it goes to (laughs) it goes to demon human hybrids i'm like it tends to happen with like um cgi uh human faces but also with animatronics like they try to make these robots that look very very human like but when you look at them something just gives you the willies and you're like, mm, no, no. And <laughs> Not today, that's Satan. the, un- yeah, that's the uncanny valley at work, which is, I think something that God has placed in our brains to let us know when we're in the presence of something that's not quite human. Yes. That's trying to look human. Yeah. It's yeah. that the lack of the image and likeness of God that is mm-hmm. intrinsic to humans, uh, you know, mm-hmm. an, autom- an automaton or whatever, or uh, CGI, they don't possess those, obviously. So there is something unsettling. It's like, it's just, 
but that's how Satan works, right? It's like these subtle deceptions that sometimes we even can justify or gloss over and go along with. And so um, it gives us this weird feelings. And, and I think everybody is in the presence of evil at one point or another, and they know it. Like you said, there's just yeah. some inbuilt thing. Um, and I find that, like I said, it comes back through the eyes. I mean, there are other things that can tip me off to it, but a lot of times I just can see in the eyes of people like, whoa, something is mm -hmm. not right here. So when you've identified, sorry, Cam, were you going to say something? No, go ahead. Okay. So when you've identified, you've locked in and you've said, okay, I, I, I feel like I've locked into this. I feel like this person might have something spiritual going on. What's, what are the first steps? What are the, the processes you run through in your mind after we've cleared away the idea that this might be like a, a mental health, drug addiction, physical abnormality, something like that? You've cleared these options away. You've zeroed in. You think something spiritual is going on. What's our next step? So the next step is it. I, I, I don't have like a handbook. I wish I did. I, maybe I'll compile one because it's different. One. Yeah, I mean, I should. I mean. Um, I'd read that. But like, it's dependent on the person because here's the, the complex issue that can come into play because a person can be demonically afflicted, possessed, depressed, whatever, and have a mental illness and mm. have a physical illness. Therefore, you have to be very careful because, uh, you know, the, it, the power of suggestion is really powerful. So if somebody comes into me uh, and I'm like, oh, yeah, you have a demon, you know, and then in their mind, oh, I have a demon, you know, um, right. and they can they can do that. But there's so much. But so the first step I do is uh, I like to do little I don't want to call them tricks, but maybe like experiments, um, you know, like with holy water or a crucifix or I ask if they can say Jesus is Lord um, or I ask them to read a passage from the Bible uh, or I you know, um, do those kind of things and see if there's any like physical stimulus from that. Or I ask them to meet me at the church building, um, or a religious place, or I have like worship music playing or something like that, or Gregorian chants, whatever. Uh, and, and sometimes I can elicit a physical response. Um, and, and that's ultimately, if that happens, then I know the next step is some level of kind of the exorcism process. Um, right. So, so, I mean, it just depends on, on a whole host of things. Like there's not one like set thing. Like I just, I, you know, like I appreciate scary movies in Hollywood, but they make it seem like there's just this, um, like checklist that one goes through. I mean, but really this is more like an episode of like criminal minds meets CSI. Like I'm tracing so many backgrounds and, <clears throat> and it depends on things. And ultimately um, God will break, make that entity manifest itself. It's nothing I do. Um, it, it, I have no superpowers or anything like that. I'm just there. Um, so, you know, I, I try holy water, like perhaps I'll put my, you know, put some on my hand and then tap them on the shoulder. I've had people singe in pain um, or I've have a small crucifix and, I'll, you know, pat them on the back or something. And they'll be like, yeah. And then sometimes there's been instances where that the the um, silhouette of the crucifix has actually burned a red mark into their skin. Um, so um, also some people just outright violently react. Um, there's vomiting. Uh, there's incredible thirst. Like there was this one guy that drank more water than I think a human body could hold. Um, because he's like, I can't quit drinking, you know? And, and, and so you have to respond to what's happening in the moment. So there's, that's kind of the beginning stages, but by the time we get to that, it's pretty, oh, I don't want to say crystal clear, but you kind of know what you're dealing with after you've jumped through all these hurdles and it's been a while. Cause again, this process can take months to get to this conclusion. Okay. Um, right. um I don't want you to have to like break any confidentiality or something, but it may be easier to just kind of take the name off of a story and kind of walk us through a situation. You think that would be okay. an easier way to kind of talk about it? Sure. Um, so you want me to tell you like how this happened? Yeah. Well, well, I guess first, how many, how many have you had to deal with so far? 
So typically, the biggest thing I deal with is actually places. Uh, people, I've had four. Um, so yeah. again, because it's rare for the people thing. Places yeah. are more common. I, I've had a lot of those. That is um, interesting because I have been in places and much more so than encountered people where I felt like the place was off. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Please continue. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So there was one situation where, uh, you know, I'll give this like emergency situation, right? Like I'm helping my friend move. Um, his girlfriend has been acting really odd. Um, she did some kind of like candle ritual um, the night before and things didn't, you know, pan out very well. And so immediately we're, we're, we've moved stuff from her apartment across to another. And immediately she just like gets that glossy, like cat, it's like a catatonic state. Like mm -hmm. maybe you're having a seizure or something, but you're just like, you know, your eyes are, but her eyes gloss over and she just starts talking in a much deeper voice. And she's like, I'm scared. I'm scared. Like that's not her voice. And so I immediately just, um, had to pull out, you know, my crucifix necklace, I put it on her head and I started praying with her. She started screaming, um, you know, you know, because there was something there. And it turns out afterwards, she had had some issues with the loss of a, a pregnancy that led her to do some things to seek comfort in other than God. Um, yeah. and, and it's heartbreaking. Um, and so I had to, on the spot, there was no chance for me. I mean, you just know at that moment, but, um, that at that moment it went on for about 10 minutes i mean her kid is right there uh my friends right there trying to keep the kids out of the room she's tensing up like almost a seizure state i have the the crucifix on her and we're praying i'm praying for god to break that and all of a sudden it was just like pow and then just peace came over her and mm. there it goes um and and that uh -huh. was it uh, real quick, there was one question that they're discussing in the comments, which is, do you ever smell it on someone? Oh, yeah. They can smell like dead flesh, sulfur, um, just really unpleasant odors, death itself um, kind of smell. Those, those mm -hmm. are things like uh, it, it, it's not uncommon to smell like decomposing bodies um, in, oh. in a person or a place that is oh manifested. Because usually a person can be possessed, you know, when they submit to that, that's a whole other process that it's not like a demon could just jump in you um, and just say, I'm here to stay. Um, there, there's a whole thing that happens, but um, sometimes, you know, people um, where it often comes from is like a haunted house, um, a place. Um, that's how, entities typically gain access. I mean, the conjuring and things like that, they're not wrong. Children are often a gateway to this because they're so in tune to a spiritual realm. They have imaginary friends. Yeah. They listen to them. Um, you know, it's, and so that's kind of a gateway where something has happened or a trauma has happened in that house, a murder, a suicide, uh, a cult ritual, uh, whatever. And, and it's something sticks there and, and stays and takes up residence. And then since Satan's ultimate goal is to steal and to kill and destroy, um, when people come into play, of course, they're going to try and take them out yeah. um, and they're good. And they're going to use the most innocent and, and, and sometimes precious things they can find to make that happen. Let me ask you a quick question. Cause we've talked about ghost stories on occasion. And I, I do want to mention one of, it's not a ghost story, but a different story that I have that deals with demons and, a situation that I can't really explain outside of God. Um, but we've, we've talked about ghost stories in the past. Um, my uh, thinking on ghosts is that it's not people, that it's other spirits, familiar spirits, stuff like that. Yep. And so I was just going to ask you one, is that your estimation as well, that they aren't ghosts that people are the dead people aren't walking around or it, do you think it is, or I guess it wouldn't be an or do you think it's essentially demonic activity? Um, yeah, I don't, I can't dis. I'm not going to go against someone who says they have like a ghost experience because I wasn't there and I don't know, but biblically it, I, there is no room for ghosts. Yeah, um, I, agree. I, I don't think that that's, that's what that is. I think Satan is often, you know, he's a liar. He's a murderer. 
Um, so are the demons that work for him and with him. Um, and so they're going to use something familiar to get your attention. Uh, they're going to use something to make you doubt what happens after death. They're going to use anything they can to maybe connect you to a, a deceased relative, um, making you think, oh, I saw a ghost or that's a spirit of someone who's departed. There's a there's a popular theology, a guy named Alexander Campbell. Uh, he believes um, that demons are actually the souls of really depraved evil men. Um, and he's not the only one. He's just the one I've read the most recent work on. Um, so, but I don't. I don't think that at all. I don't think the biblical uh, story and the redemptive story of God leaves room for that. I mean, it says it's appointed right. once for man to die and then face the judgment. You know, and and then we have you know all the stories of Jesus and 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 things like that. I I don't think there's like a purgatory state um, that people are like floating around in. They haven't crossed over yet, um, and you know. That, that's my thought. I think it's complete demonic activity. I also think you could probably look at UFOs the same way. Or we're cryptids. on the same page, my brother. We're um, on the same the, page. Yeah, it's it's all just trying to distract people from what's really going on. Yeah, that's the goal. Like Satan is the ultimate wag the dog, right? Like uh, look over here. It's pay no attention over here. You know, this is it, it's mind bending, but just enough that you don't always notice it. Like the, the people we were talking about, the Valley of Uncanny or whatever. It's just something is off, but maybe not. Maybe it's just me, you know, but something is weird. But and so we roll with it. So I don't think ghosts are a thing um, at so all. We've been talking a lot recently in the on the show in the last couple episodes about um, psychedelic experiences, taking mushrooms, doing DMT, things of that nature. And I kind of relayed how I was at a reggae festival. I took mushrooms. I had like a pretty, what I felt was a pretty positive experience. Um, and then my priest had a word with me afterward because he happened to have listened to that podcast episode. And he wanted me to know, hey, you know, this could be a gateway for things that are not positive. And after that, I talked to Cam about it. And after that, I actually um, started to remember that there was a friend of mine on that very same trip, who um, the tri trip to Tennessee, which is where we went, not the trip. <laughs> um, but he had taken his entire weekend's worth of mushrooms on the first night. And um, he and his girlfriend ended up having like these horrible physical fights. Um, they ended up like the the roommates who lived with them ended up moving away from them because they said things had gotten so bad between them and it sort of all linked back to this one night where in the woods we took these psychedelic substances and i have this very clear memory of him like catatonically leaning against a tree just sort of like looking up into the sky completely zonked out on these mushrooms and all of this sort of started coming together for me and i was like wait a minute like maybe even though I was having this like positive experience with my, you know, little dose that I did, he over here like took the whole thing and opened up the doors and, you know, the house that, um, I don't know if he brought something back to that house from the forest with him or something from that for some, something from that house had come into the woods with him. But either way, that house ended up having to be demolished. The people who actually owned the home after him and his girlfriend had moved out of it, they tore it down. There was just something about it that um, they couldn't sell it. Nobody wanted the house any longer. It was this adorable 90-year-old farmhouse with like a slat ceiling. Like everything about it was totally cute. They ended up demolishing it. To this day, no home has been rebuilt on the property. Mm -hmm. And all of this started sort of come together in my mind after we talked about how this psychedelic substances can actually be a great gateway to like demonic things. And then you were talking about how places can actually hold these entities. So mm -hmm. he, after he moved away from that situation, he got a lot better. His life improved a great deal, but the house had to be torn down and nothing else has been built on the spot. And to this day, when I drive by that place, I don't look at it directly. I'm just mm -hmm. like, whatever's there. I don't, I don't want it coming home in the car with me. So I don't look at it, you know? Um, right. And places make sense because if you look yeah. at um, the the past uh, few episodes when we talked about you know the prince of Persia or the prince of uh, of Greece these these spiritual beings were over specific regions and nations it makes a lot of sense that they would stake ground and try to take over some portion they, of the earth so, they're I mean, very territorial um, <laughs> even if their territory is is a house or a field or a tree 
or a doll. Um, you know, um, demons are very territorial because they don't want to be found, right? Um, right. <laughs> because they know their time is short. And um, so it's wild. Like, certainly drugs can play a role in, in that. I mean, I had a similar experience as your friend in Tennessee with a lot of mushrooms as well um, <laughs> at a very big music festival. Um, and it was a terrible experience it wasn't uh, camp reggae was it <laughs> no it was it was it was bonnaroo okay, <laughs> okay. So, yeah bonnaroo is um, terrible too <laughs> yeah i went to the second year that they had it what a wild thing that was um oh, wow so um but yeah i mean that was terrible but yeah i mean if you look at galatians uh 5 i believe paul talks about the sins of the flesh and uh, being obvious and they talks about um like witchcraft being one of those and mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. what's interesting is if you look at the greek and the witchcraft it's it's not necessarily what we think of witchcraft like um in that sense it's stuff that alters your mind um right and so absolutely those those things can play because it, it weakens your cognition um in a sense and opens you up to things that you normally wouldn't experience yeah and uh, it also leaves you very vulnerable very vulnerable. and 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 from what i've been told by a lot of people very trusting yes mm -hmm. unless unless it's a really bad trip then it's like right because uh, everybody's like good <laughs> vibe like good vibes man it's all good everybody's exactly healthy, you know and you like normally the the... i'm i'm very scared of insects and like outdoor creepy crawlies and when I was on mushrooms, I remember I was like digging my hands down into the dark soil in the middle of the night, in the dead middle of the Tennessee woods. My indoor butt would never do a thing <laughs> like that. And here I was right. just like burying myself in the ground. Like I'm coming back to the earth. <laughs> oh my God, that's exactly what it was. And I was like, I'm communing with my mother. And yeah. like, I had this whole thing. And for me, it felt like a positive experience, but it seems to me now looking back on my friend who I'm not going to name, but he knows who he is. I remember him looking with like the eyes and like being leaned against this tree, staring into the sky. We couldn't get his attention. And then after that, everything in their lives was downhill. Like in, in the house where that all took place no longer stands. And so I think that there's something, there's definitely some um, experience in my own life, you know, where I feel like maybe I dodged a bullet here. Like I felt mm -hmm. like I had a positive experience here but maybe it's because the things that could have been attacking me were much busier with somebody else with a much wider open door at that point. Mm -hmm. But, but there for the grace of God, go I, you know, Amen. Um, um, there, this, uh, what Noah asks, what about a car? Could they inhabit one as with a place or a doll? And before you answer, mm -hmm. I want to say the doll is actually super interesting to me because Don't in reading um, some of the books that I've read by the unseen realm by Michael Heiser, um, fight the powers uh but if you when i read more into what michael heiser wrote uh, which i will put that book in the the description if anyone wants to read what i've been reading or have read um but he talked about how these gods who were uh you know sons of god the you know the drill uh these these spiritual beings that was part of the reason why idols were such a no-no is because there would be these these rituals to have the uh god or demon inhabit that idol yep. and and take residence in it and so like a doll yeah of course i've never made that connection until just now but yeah of course annabelle could be a thing because mm -hmm. if someone invited and so do you think cars and something smaller like a car or a doll is a, a vehicle for uh, demonic activity I mean, so the, the quickest one I can look at is like James Dean's car. Um, mm -hmm. Research that thing. Oh, um, yeah. That thing was something was up with that car. Um, you know, it was it was cursed and you killed, you know, had all kind of terrible things. So I, I think anything, uh, if it's given the proper, you know, environment and conditions and messing around. Yeah, absolutely. It can it can do anything like that. I mean, because you're dealing with supernatural beings um, that can manipulate energy and, and different things all around, you know. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. Cars and things like that could do that. What do you what's your take on these? Do you think that and I have felt for a long time that these are gateways, like and definitely in the very real sense, they're gateways. But 
this this whole thing right here seems very um, dubious to me. I've been wondering about these for a while. So cell phone like technology is like a double edged sword, right? I, I think ultimately what this is has done for us is we've built a digital tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we have become techno gods. You know, we are able now to speak in any language via Google Translate. We're able to be anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, we're able to talk with people and know information instantly. Uh, so it's like this really, you know, counterfeit omniscience, omnipresent and omnipotence that, that goes on. So I think we have recreated Babel in the digital form and technological God. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a, there's a new book out um, and I can't remember it's called here are your gods. And it's written by a guy from England. Um, and I, I had it and it's at home now and I can't remember the name of it, but he, he talks about this a whole lot. Like the things we imbue with power, because Paul even says, right? Like, uh, you know, there's, there's two ways we could look at demons in the Bible. First off, like idols, like statues, things, uh, those things in and of themselves have no power. It's what they represent. Right. And right. Paul says they're not gods in Deuteronomy. God completely demolishes the idea that there is any other God that could compete with him. Right. Like Yahweh is over all. He is the only God. Yet we do find these you know, statues and, and temples and cults that ascribe power to these things. And, um, you know, that that's I, I do believe that anything that can be it's like the police say anything you say can and will be used against you. Um, mm. So that's the book you're scrolling on the bottom. Christopher J. H. Right. Um, good call. Um, but uh, you know, it, I, I think they can be gateways. Uh, these things are pure, you know, awesomeness. There are good sides to them, you know, but most There's of the time it's terrible. Some horrible porn on them as well. That will destroy yeah. your whole life. <laughs> Absolutely. That's super woof. Super easy access with like no limitations. No, none, yeah. none whatsoever. Sin is very free and easy on the internet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one, I've... one of the things that I think is interesting and I've thought for a while um, is we have these cultural tales and cultural monsters. So we have vampires, we have werewolves. And when I think about vampires in particular, there's this idea that in order for a vampire to enter the house, you must ask permit. He must ask mm -hmm. permission. He must be invited in. Mm -hmm. And and there are a lot of things, different attributes to vampires, werewolves, these different ideas um, that I think translate to demonic activity. Because I don't mm -hmm. think a, a demon gets in without an invitation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I think that they are energy suckers. They 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 pull your energy and any joy you have out of you they suck you dry i think there are a lot of these analogs to these mythical monsters that we have these cryptids and maybe they even look like that in some way um but my question to you is um let's talk about that entrance let's talk about how they get in because you know ouija boards my mom never let me look at a ouija board much less touch one much less touch a planchette um like when w earlier in my my life, there was a friend of mine who wanted to have an idol in our our dorm room, and it was it was a statue of Ganesh. It's cool, and I'm like, I will destroy it with a hammer. I need you to know that I will destroy the thing. And he's like, No, you can't. And I'm like, I I will. Don't put it in here. If you want that thing, keep it in keep it in storage until we we're you're in a different room than mine. Right. I, I ain't doing it. Um, but let I do want to talk about how people get to this point because I feel like um, human will and choice is an aspect of this. Absolutely. Uh, so there are levels of, I don't know, I think the formal Catholic Church term is like levels of diabolical influence, which sounds like a really awesome industrial metal band. Um, <laughs> but like, so the first one is what's called the, the ordinary, um, and that is temptation. Um, that's something every human being is subject to at any time, all the time, um, and that we, you know, fight. Okay, that's step one. Um, the other four are called the extraordinary levels of diabolical influence. So these are 
when I give into a sin, right? I give into temptation because we have to remember Satan does not make me do anything. Um, mm -hmm. like he can't make anyone do anything. Like uh, I have to choose to do that. Right. So, uh, if I continue to indulge in, in a sin, um, that I know is wrong and, and I don't fight back against it, you know, um, then at some point I kind of take my, myself out of not, I'm not going to say I lose my, my soul, but I open myself up to a foothold. Um, that that's what Paul talks about. Like Paul talks about, don't let Satan have a foothold in you, right? Like, so temptation mm -hmm. is step one. Every human being is subject to that at any time in your life. Jesus himself was subject to that, right? So um, we, we understand that. Um, what happens next is, is where it gets dicey and like creepy um, because then you have what's called demonic um, oppression. Okay. Yes. So that's um, maybe you get to the stage where, you cannot any longer control a behavior or a pattern or an activity. Uh, and, and you are, you feel it bearing down on you almost. And there's very little control left in you, but you can still fight it back and you don't have to give into it. Right. So like addiction. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and I mean, addiction has a whole nother set to it, but yeah, that's a good example. Right. Like, um, but, but once you move past that, then you move to what's called demonic obsession. Um, and that, that's where this, where the battlefield is, is your brain, right? Like, so, um, this is where the battle amps up to 20. Um, you can't think about anything, but a certain thing. Um, for instance, one of the first things I ever did, it, it was like my first investigation. It was a guy who, he was very wealthy, very grew up with, you know, very wealthy, had no technical hands, handyman skills. And all of a sudden his wife noticed all he would do was make these handmade antique axes. <laughs> um, he oh. didn't have axes. He didn't know how to build things before this. Uh, he really didn't care about it, but he couldn't stop. I mean, axes were everywhere falling out of the car closets piled up in the garage could not stop. That's all he did was make axes. And this, hmm. then all of a sudden, all this weird phenomenon started manifesting in the house. So that, that this is the point at which the demonic is able to subvert your will and get you to focus so much on one thing, uh, whether it be lust or drugs or power or, um, violence. you know, violence, war, politics, whatever the case may be. And it's all you could think about. Um, and so that's demonic hmm. obsession. So the next step may becomes it can go either way. Uh, and again, these are not necessarily in order, but then we have demonic infestation. Okay. Uh, that's where you have now subconsciously or consciously even given this entity consent to basically move in. Um, mm -hmm. It's such a part of your life. And this is where it becomes very hard to separate because I think a lot of the demonic experiences that I've, I've encountered, it's like an abusive relationship. Um, if you do what you're supposed to do, everything's cool. The moment you start trying to get back from that or fight back or say no, that's when the crazy stuff starts. That's when you have physical manifestations, that's where you have nightmares, that's where you have uncontrollable, um, you know, physical, you know, jerks and, you know, weird things or your house, the doors start flapping open or, you know, the, the all that stuff. Um, so the demon has entity or entities have taken up residence because you have subconsciously given into that, that thing you've consented almost like the vampire analogy. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's not like somebody saying, yes, I want you to come in. Um, it, it's very subtle, right? Like, yeah. um, and then ultimately I mean, this culminates is I'm inviting them into your home and to talk to oh, you. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're, you're saying you're welcome <laughs> here. Um, which is like, no, don't, don't do that. Terrible things happen. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and then that ultimately can lead to um, demonic possession, which is the ultimate where a demon takes control. And there are different levels of possession. There's partial possession. There's perfect possession, which is back to your guys like Lenin and Hitler. Um, they are so in tune. It's almost like 
you know, Eddie Brock and Venom. I don't know if that'll get you yeah. a trademark strike. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But it's like a symbiote. Like they're functioning together. They thrive off each other and they want. And some people, uh, especially in witchcraft and the occult practice, they want to be possessed. Yeah. Um, they, they, they want that to happen. And so they seek that out and that, that, that sometimes they become perfectly possessed and that's your like very evil figures that, that we typically think of. Um, and, and some people are so infiltrated by that. You would never be able to, to know. I mean, those are the hardest ones, um, to even remotely try and approach. Um, but there's partial, but you can have like part of your finger possessed i don't know i mean it's just th there's this whole thing or your whole body can be or uh everything can be but what ba basically possession is the state you are no longer in control of your mind your thoughts or your subconscious at any given time whenever the demon feels like manifesting itself huh. so that's that's it, it all comes from this consent that is somehow made at some point uh whether you want that or not by inviting them in listening uh you know, all these things. Um, and you've given that entity permission to move in, whether to your body or your home or your property or a doll or whatever. Um, I, and I, I think that that's why um, we have to be careful about certain things, because, I mean, you, you spoke about the witchcraft and you talked about, you know, drugs and, and, and the like with that. Not not to mention that when when people imagine witchcraft these days, it's divorced from its roots. Because uh, the roots of witchcraft came out of the different pantheons where these people lived. So witches were trying to get in touch with specific gods. They were trying to get in touch with specific things. And, you know, there is some that still do that with the Wiccan stuff and um, other areas like that. But there's this very sterilized Harry Potter view of witchcraft that's completely mm -hmm. divorced from oh, this, yeah. this idea. And so, you know, th that's why there are things th that I won't touch. Like there, there are symbols that I won't allow near me. There are um, different aspects of like for, for one thing is I, I really like Thor. I don't see in, like the Marvel character. Mm -hmm. I don't see any problem with the comic book version of the hammer, but the actual cast engraved uh, Mjolnir's. I bought one and I was very compelled to throw it the hell away. Yeah. And That's it's stuff I, power. Yeah. I think you've made me realize that I may have had a demonic experience and I'm fairly concerned <laughs> right now, but um, I, I recently, <laughs> I, I recently quit smoking marijuana about 90 days ago. And, um, the first ever time in my life that I've ever had a sleep paralysis experience was probably like 30 days into my quit. And I've been told that when you quit smoking weed, you have um, strong dreams. And so I kind of just chalked it up to that. But I remember telling Cam about this experience. I'm, I'm not sure if you remember me talking to you about it or not, yeah. Cam. But um, the dream that I had was of being held deep underground in a dark, dark place where no one could ever possibly find me or make their way to me or get me out of there. And something was sitting on top of me with its face right in my face, smiling at me, telling me there's nothing you can do about it. And I woke up and I couldn't move a muscle. And I just like was laying there. It was as, it was as if someone had tucked you in with your blankets and tucked the blankets underneath you. And I just felt like I had been tucked in too tightly. So I like, I wriggled and wriggled for a little while. I managed to get my arm free. I made the sign of the cross and then the, it dissipated all around me like a cloud of smoke. And I really just kind of thought, no, you freaked yourself out. You had a bad dream because you quit smoking weed. And I really kind of chalked it up to that. But just before this experience, I had been having um, trouble quitting because the aspect of spiritual warfare scared me to this point where I thought, well, if I just smoke a little bit, they'll leave me alone. And so I would find myself going to my vaporizer and I would hit my vape just a little bit so that whatever was out there would be like convinced to leave Placated. me alone. Do what? Placated. Placated, right. And I realized 
I realized what I was doing was um, acting in a way to please demons and not mm -hmm. to please God. And I, I did make a decision at that point where I was like, no, I'm not going to do that because I'm act I'm literally acting to please demons. Mm -hmm. So about 30 days, I had that horrible sleep paralysis experience and I've never forgotten it. But, um, as I've gotten further and further away from my um, weed addiction, it's been getting better, but I'm actually about to be confirmed um, on the 31st of this month into my church awesome. from, athe from atheism and um, left and right, just things seem to be going wrong around me. <laughs> and I'm at like, trouble is just following me around. Staying yeah. here. And I'm like, and between that and what we're what we're doing right now, I think that we yeah. are in, we are embattled. In mm -hmm. And my I talked to my priest a little bit about it, and he said, I mean, I talked to him maybe a couple of weeks ago, and he said, as this day gets closer, you're going to notice we, some slightly weird things starting to happen. But stay mm -hmm. the course, keep praying, keep making the sign of the cross. And I've been doing that, but like it just I don't know when you were talking, it just kind of like really landed on me. I'm like, now I know why all of these like weird little things are happening around me. And I am just like having the worst week. And I'm like, okay, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe things are trying to throw me off my game and make me behave in ways that I shouldn't, you know? And like, I don't know, just the, I've never in my life had a sleep paralysis experience before ever, ever, ever. It just, mm -hmm. I don't know. That just makes sense to me. Suddenly some things that have been happening to me make sense to me. And yeah, yeah. as you draw, as you draw nearer from to God, right? Like, um, the, the Satan doesn't care about you till you try and leave the team, if that makes mm. sense. Um, so because his ultimate goal is your eternal destruction, right? Like, uh, you know, separating you from God. Um, so as you get closer to that, yeah, things intensify. Yeah. Um, and then once you're done, once you become a Christian, you know, that, that doesn't, you're able to resist it a lot more because you're filled with the Holy Spirit and things of baptism and all that. Um, so you have a helper that, that Jesus has given us, but it doesn't go away. I mean, these things may go away for a long time, but they'll, they'll rear their head. <laughs> and I don't, I don't, I don't say that to scare you, but I want you to realize you're not going through anything that anybody else doesn't yeah. and I'm proud yeah. of I, just meeting you. I'm I'm proud of you. Keep up, man. You're Thank doing you. it. You are doing it. It's been yeah. a, it's been a rough week, man. <laughs> like I think I know why now. <laughs> it's all oh, like everything is spiritual. It is. Yeah. There is no yeah. separation. And I was just gonna say you him saying that it keeps going. I'm in this Christianity thing for 30 years and I'm I'm in battle right now. And so I mean uh, one one question someone wanted to ask, and it, I, it's a good question because sleep paralysis is often portrayed as a purely physical phenomenon. It's purely yeah. uh, whatever's going on in your brains, hormones, whatever, however they want to describe it. But I had I've had one experience with s sleep paralysis, and it's not something I like to talk about because it's 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 so dark, and I. I almost don't want to share that story because I don't want to elicit fear in other people and give him this that up, power. The girlfriend? No, no, no. That one I'll tell because oh, okay. we won that one. This is okay. this is something else. Um, but okay. it's one of those things that because of what the dream it was that I had and what happened directly after during this this sleep paralysis, I I go, I don't think this is purely physical. How do you feel about sleep paralysis? Sleep paralysis is one of those tricky things. Like, is it involved pretty heavily in demonic stuff? Um, yeah, ish. I mean, it's there's always parts where that is present. Um, I think this is where Satan is really expert, um, if you want to call him that. Um, the demons are because it, it's a it is a physical biological function that happens, but. You know, it's almost like the Hebrew uh, concept of like thin spaces, right? Like when you're asleep, um, your subconscious is running the show, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so you're in a, I don't want to say you're in an altered state of being, but you're, you're kind of just out there. And then when you come into this like sleep paralysis state, um, mm -hmm. I mean, what you described is exactly what every person who has ever had sleep paralysis will describe it that way. 
Uh, Mine you know, was different. It, there might be some variations. That's what I was going to say. Like, I, I there was one guy that, you know, had sleep paralysis and he watched the entity crawl through his house and jump on him and woke up and it was still there. Um, so, I mean, mm -mm. It's, it can happen. Mm -mm. Um, so, very, don't like that. Very symbolic. Yeah. And then, but like, it was, but I mean, you're in like this weird altered place and you can't really control it. Um, yeah. But, but you have enough of your faculties to realize this is not right. Like, right. and so there is a battlefield there. So sometimes sleep paralysis is just sleep paralysis. Other times it's not. You and know, sometimes it's someone's like it. waking you up just enough to mess with you. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you this story that I told, I think I've told on the show before. I dated a girl one time and she lived about an hour and a half away from me. And one night I, I woke up and it was like three o'clock in the morning. It was three o'clock in the morning. It was on the dot. And, um, I felt compelled to pray for her. I felt that I needed to pray for her. We hadn't talked. She was asleep. I felt compelled to pray for her and, um, like spiritual battle prayer. And so I wake up and I sit there and for 15 minutes, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm praying and I'm rebuking the devil from, from my bed. You know, I'm like <laughs> saying the name of Jesus. I'm praying for this girl. And I, I go back to sleep at 15 minutes later, like the witching hour as it were, but I go back to sleep at 15 minutes later and um, don't really, I wake up the next morning. I was like, Oh, that was weird. And then I go on, I go to work, I get on with my day. And uh, then I get a call from her when she wakes up and she said, Cam, I had a dream all night long last night that I was being raped by a demon. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's horrifying. And she goes, it, it, it lasted for hours, this dream. And, uh, and then I woke up at 315 and I felt a peace and then I went back to sleep. And I was like, that's really strange. And then like literally days later, I happened upon this article. And in the article, it talks about how dreams can last. Uh, they can feel like they're lasting all night, but typically they last Just around minutes. 15 minutes right. at most. And so I'm sitting there and I'm like, I, that was when I woke up. That was when I started praying for you. What was going on there? And this girl had a lot of issues. I'm not, I'm not, you know, not downing her, but there was a lot of stuff going on in her life that I, I was like praying for. And so there's this this moment in this fighting. And so I guess that leads into the question. I obviously not everyone should be out there um, exercising demons from houses or regions or whatever. But what can we do as Christians? Because I don't think there's power elsewhere. Um, I know there's not. But how can we as Christians and even people who aren't saved, what can they do? to fight these powers what like what, what, is, what is our level. job <laughs> what's the layman's job the layman's job is just exactly what you know i guess if you an exorcist job is 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 prayer and vigilance um uh, like I, we severely underestimate the power of prayer um uh, i can't tell you how powerful i feel when i i have these feelings of stuff happening and i i say i rebuke you in the name of jesus christ mm -hmm. I can't tell you the power I feel there. I it's terrifying when you're in the thick of like an actual exorcism. That's wild uh, stuff's happening, but you have that, like that's when faith comes through. Cause there's no other way out of this. Yeah. Like God has to show up and I'm going to lean on him. Cause he's the only way out. Um, you know? And so I, I think, you know, it sounds like, that girl you're dating had a, you know, there's demons called incubus and succubus, right. That are sexually, yeah. you know, molesty, they're handsy. Um, and so, um, that can <laughs> happen. And I think it's, at one point. <laughs> it's, it sounds like you did battle with that and God, you know, took care of the problem. And so what can you do? You can pray, like be vigilant. And also I think in the Western church, and especially the American church now, um, prayer is one of those things that's become so rote and 
you know, so many people just view it as like a repetition of like almost an incantation. But the best thing you can do is to take time for yourself to be with God and, and practice like contemplative prayer where you're you're not praying at that particular moment to um, get something from God, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but just to simply be with him. And that's what strengthens you, like in the silence and the solitude of the soul. Uh, St. John of the Cross writes about this, The Dark Night of the Soul, incredible work that I think is almost should be required reading for every Christian. But it's in these moments of solitude that you spend quietly just soaking in the presence of God for no other reason other than being with him that strengthens you to have those faith-filled prayers to where you know God is able to do that. And and prayer is the thing. Like Paul says, we don't fight against people. We don't use the weapons of the world. You know, our weapons are spiritual. What's the spiritual weapon? You have your faith, you got the word of God, and you got prayer. That's Mm -hmm. our weapons. And so that's your arsenal. And every Christian has that. Yeah, and no weapons formed against us will prosper. No, none. It may look like it, um, but it, it won't. It won't happen. So there is an Orthodox um, Easter, I'm being confirmed in the Eastern Orthodox Church, and um, there is a short Orthodox prayer that we pray in times of trouble. Because when you are in trouble, it's maybe hard to think of the right words, the right things to say. And so we say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And it's a very, the Jesus prayer. It's very short. You can memorize it easily and you can run it. You know, um, almost on a loop when, yep. and I definitely do when I'm, I'm feeling upset and anxious and unable to like order my own thoughts, which is something that anxiety really does to you as it makes mm-hmm. your thoughts a jumble. I use the Jesus prayer to recenter everything and just focus myself on Christ. And, um, I have not had that prayer fail me yet to bring me back down to earth from, whatever terrible imagining I am working myself up into. And so um, just, you know, wanted to throw that out there to the audience. If they find themselves in times of trouble, the Jesus prayer, it's short, it's sweet, and you can run it. <laughs> yeah. And and if you're, if you're a little bit more uh, into the, the longer form stuff, my parents always led me to, and um, J- uh, Josh mentioned this and uh, I believe uh, so did, um, Noah, uh, Psalm 91. It's, it's this passage that, and, and they asked me to read it. I, I, I don't want to save it till the end of the show because, you know, we'll get into other stuff there, but I will read the whole thing. So if you don't like the Bible, you're not going to like this part, but this is the passage that I have historically read when I'm afraid or when I feel like something's going on. Um, mm-hmm. he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I, in him I will trust. Surely he del- he will shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you, you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid by the terror by night nor the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent shall tremble underfoot because he has set his love upon me. Therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. You can't tell me you, you, when you read that, that you don't feel power. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. That's a, yeah, I love the Psalms. Um, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Psalter, mm-hmm. but it is um, sort of a way that you can say all of the Psalms within the space of a week. And um, I have a like a schedule for it or whatever, but I was told that if you do the Psalter every day for a year, 
your life will be completely different spiritually. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that it is you're going to get that job or, you know, that girl you like right. will go out with you. That's not what I'm saying. But spiritually, what you can manifest in yourself if you uh, focus your attention on the Psalms and, and recite them to yourself. Uh, that it will make things different for you. So I'm in I'm in the midst of my year right now, but um, I am a completely different person than who I was in January of this year, and I can only I can only attribute that to the power of God. I didn't have the power to do that on my own. Amen. I wanted I wanted to quit weeds. So, like I keep bringing this back to weed, but I wanted to quit weeds so bad. And every time I would say to myself, "I'm not going to smoke today." I would literally find myself holding that vaporizer and smoking it and being like, what am I doing? I just said, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do this. And there's a great, um, I think it was St. Paul who talks about having this similar experience. It probably wasn't with pot, but that <laughs> what he willed, what he wanted in his mind and what his flesh wanted to do were different things. And on his own, his flesh won every time. Yep. And I was like, yeah, that's a really relatable experience, St. Paul. Um, mm -hmm. As an atheist, especially as an atheist woman, St. Paul is sort of looked at as one of the greatest villains of the Bible. But when you um, read him critically and read him as a Christian, you see like he's um, everybody's damaged as me and mm -hmm. still became one of God's greatest saints. And so now like Paul is like my favorite and it's so weird to go from that place where Paul was the greatest of all villains to me to now it's really? like, what does St. Paul have to say about this? Because it's really going to apply to my life. And um, I, re I remember the first time we talked about Paul, like a, probably a year ago or before. And I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. I was like, let me tell you about Paul, who is maybe yeah. the coolest dude. Right. <laughs> Besides Jesus. Right. Right. <laughs> Paul's an awesome. Yeah. Well, you, we, the women would always say, oh, well, he says, women obey your husbands. And yes, he does say that. He says, women obey your husbands. And then the passage that he says for men is like four times as long about yep, what harder. men need to do for their wives. It's Including like the, die for her. Including die for her. Oh my gosh. I listened to a homily by St. John Chrysostom um, on marriage and he draws from Paul's uh, writing about that. And in the section for the wives is like this. It's like, wives, be nice to your husbands. Don't, don't nag them too much. And then the thing about the husbands is like, you should lay down your life and bleed for this woman. Yep. I was like, this is so romantic. <laughs> <laughs> like, right. Yeah, it, it's it huge. Beautiful. Yeah, and it's unfortunate that women will turn away from that because of the way that tiny little part of it has been framed. Because yeah. women, that passage holds you up in so many ways. Like, and and it's so good. It's it, I believe that the Bible and the Christian that Christianity was actually a women's rights movement, Absolutely. not in the way we understand women's rights today, but in the context of the ancient world, it was literally like a huge <laughs> women's rights movement. Um, and that the, the epistles from Paul are a huge part of that. Absolutely. Sorry, tangent. <laughs> I do yeah. want to bring in a couple of questions that I saw that I thought would be good for later. Um, on. one Noah asked on Twitter, uh, home, there's a homeless woman that calls herself Moloch, which is, that's not a good, that's a good, not a good starting point. Moloch's not, <laughs> no, not a good starting point and does not seem to respond to commands in the name of Jesus. Further, she says, if he wants me, he's going to take me from my man. I'm waiting for him. What would you do in that situation? I mean, that's, I, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm reminded of an episode. You remember the show Chips? <laughs> I never watched it, but yeah. Vaguely. <laughs> so, so there is a, an episode where, it's basically like a parody of Kiss, like Gene Simmons. It was a Halloween episode in 1982, and the guy's name was Moloch, um, the Gene Simmons figure. And uh, he sings a song that almost repeats like that kind of word, if when the devil takes me, he'll take me from my man. Um, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I don't know if maybe this whole, 
is a chips fan <laughs> i can't see that being a legitimate <laughs> response for anyone but uh you well, know they did um, put they did put in this and i didn't understand it so i didn't say it but she calls herself moloch olak olak so maybe she was a chips fan could be or olak olak also is kind of a scottish vernacular um kind of thing but ultimately when we look at hmm. moloch and somebody calling themselves that we're drawn back to molek yeah. um you know that that guy the the child sacrifice god um you know lowercase g demon guy um so yeah i i don't know you i i don't know to speculate i mean just keep praying for her um we're familiar with the story of the seven sons of skiva in acts where the demon literally beats the dog snot out of these dudes who think they're exorcists and sends them away butt yeah. naked running into the street. Um, you know, <laughs> so, and Jesus also says there are certain things that only come out by prayer and fasting. Um, so mm -hmm. just keep praying for this woman. Um, maybe there's some mental health issues. Maybe there is a, a spiritual issue, um, but just keep praying for her, you know, and, and, and try that. That's what I would do. I mean, I don't, I wish I could say, oh yeah, you know, you know, take three aspirin at 3 p.m. and it'll go away but it doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> that'd work be that nice way. huh <laughs> yeah uh another question was from paul um and the apostle he, he asked uh no we can just call him Nicole. brandon let's Nicole. go brandon um uh, he asked can you be repossessed by the same demon after an exorcism i have my thoughts on this yes, but you I, can. Wanted to... I know about yeah. this yeah jesus says so Yes. Um, he says that you can clean the house, push the demon out, and but then you don't replace it with, with seven of his with friends. God God stuff. Then seven more come back, and you're worse off than you were before. You could absolutely be repossessed by the same entity or multiple other ones. Um, so yeah, you can be if you continue in the pattern. Like if you were asking, what can non Christians do in spiritual warfare? And I don't. And again, I I, I don't. My, my passion is, is, is Jesus. Um, so if you're not a Christian and you're listening to this, the, the, the only absolute protection and, and surefire help in this is God. And it's Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, he's yeah. the only way out of any of this. He's the only uh, one that's more powerful because by demons and Satan are no match for God. There is no you know, yin and yang. Satan has yeah. lost to God. But if you are outside of Christ, you are very much an inferior uh, spiritual being to them, and they can eat you for lunch. Uh, demons can. So find, get to Jesus. I know there's a lot of religious baggage. I know there's a lot of stuff. And, you know, as a pastor of a church, uh, I just speaking, I apologize for that. We've done a lot of things wrong. But I can tell you that we're all not crazy. Like Jesus is legitimately the savior of the world and he is our Amen. God and, and he is the only way out of any of this, like any Amen. kind of exorcism that happens. It's not the person. It's not the person doing it, it is completely 100% Jesus. Um, <laughs> it's just Ezekiel talks about the, the, the guy who's who, who will stand in the gap, right. Of the broken down walls that, that passage, you know, a guy, a person performing an exorcist or fighting in spiritual warfare, or even praying for someone else, you are standing in the gap, right? You're, you're putting yourself out there for someone else. And that's the most, you're laying down yourself to help someone. That's, you're never more like Jesus than when you do that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I think that's, the power that comes through that. And, you know, so if you're not a Christian, you're listening to this, like this isn't just weird stuff. There's, there's a reason there's thousands and thousands of years of history from, from Genesis all the way through the new Testament and, and Jesus that, that it's stuck around and people, billions of people follow him. It's not just hogwash. Yeah. There's a bunch of weird stuff out there. There's a bunch of pseudo Christians and televangelists and terrible sex abusers. And Satan is one of the most frequent attenders of church. Um, so, yeah, I get it. It can suck, yeah. but you have to be in Christ to be immune, if you want to look at it that way, uh, or at least really protected against yeah. demonic I mean, possession. The Jesus vaccine works. I can't speak for yeah. the others. <laughs> I think that there is something to be said about how one of the greatest arguments against Christianity can be Christians. 
And yes. there are a lot of people who uh, don't want anything to do with the church and don't want anything to do with mainstream Christianity because of the evil that they see going on. And they're rightly identifying that they're not wrong about right. some of that stuff. Um, but, you know, I think at the end of the day, if you were confronted with some real scary spiritual stuff, you most of those people would still be calling out for Jesus at that point. I know I, mean, I know I, I've found myself in that boat before. I mean, demonic activity and the fear that can come with it and the side effects of it are very powerful apologetics <laughs> um you know uh, but so it, it, it's it's very you know like before i was a christian the night before i i that girl gave me the book for my birthday in college that we talked about at the beginning um i prayed out to every god and goddess and thing that I ever could think of. And I even called out to Jesus, uh, but I didn't want anything to do with him, but I called out anyway. Jesus was the only one who answered and he showed up the next morning when I was going to kill myself. Yeah. That's it. There is no other God. Um, yeah. There's false. And, and so that's the, the allure of the satanic is that it's, 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 it puts a high value on worshiping yourself and your interests yes. And takes all the focus off Christ, right? Like, mm -hmm. so that's that's the opening opening salvo of Satan is to get you distracted from Christ and to focus on yourself. And mm -hmm. you can focus on your ambitions or your dreams or money or drugs or power or you know whatever. But even your shame, can, yeah, or your guilt or your remorse mm -hmm. or yep. your your own self esteem can sabotage you, right? Like, yep. um. So all of these things are weapons that Satan is using. Satan is a, a, a evil is a master psychiatrist. They they will sit <laughs> and wait and know how you tick like the stalkers they are, and they will pounce at just the right moment when you're the weakest. Yeah. Well, and and one thing that I want to mention is you know you you mention Satanism, and I think that that the Church of Satan rather than Satanism is a very good tool that the enemy uses because uh, it's like Anton LaVey and they, the people who are Satanists talk about how they're just atheists with aesthetics or they're athe <laughs> yeah. atheists with flair. And I'm like, you have the worst aesthetics I've ever seen, but um, they, they've kind of turned this Satanism thing into just this benign atheist thing. And when in fact, that's just pulling away from, very real Satanists, deistic Satanists, because I, yeah. I there was a when I worked at the leather store, there was the guy, um, a, a guy who worked in um, he did a lot of cleaning of different buildings and he was contracted by the government uh, at one point to clean up a, a an occult site of Satanists that they'd kicked out of this apartment building. Yikes. And so, you know, he, uh, we were kind of having a conversation about this somewhat and he was saying, um, and he had pictures, he showed pictures afterwards. So I, I know it's true. Um, he was, he's saying when he was cleaning it out, he, there were bones on the floor, there were the, the symbols, but the thing that stuck out to him the most was, uh, when he, when they opened the door for the first time, there was, they had hooked up a bicycle that would be let go when the door came in and they had taken the, the, the tires off. And I saw a picture of this bike and there were razor blades embedded into the tires. So what would happen is when someone opened the door, the, the bike would come down and try to hit you with these razor blades because they were that angry. Not cool, they bro. Were, they were losing their apartment. And so whenever someone says that Satanism is not what you think it is, it's like, that's nonsense. There's a cult yeah. stuff going on. That's just a front. Um, but I did want to mention, like, I am not saying that Christians shouldn't trick or treat or do Halloween stuff. That's personal conviction. You have to deal with that. But I will say I always, every year when Halloween comes around, my spirit is constantly in check. It's in check mode. It's mm -hmm. in uncomfortable mode. And partially it's because I know that there's a lot of shady stuff going on. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of worship and calling on dark things. I know this. It's fact. People, the people tell you it's not real. 
that the satanic and it, the, the, how well did the satanic panic in the 90s do to dissuade people later on to from believing in right, any of the occult right. stuff right um but i one halloween okay so i've had two traumatized well was it two or is that the same halloween i can't remember it may have been the same halloween but we woke up halloween morning and we had this little puppy named cosmo and his mom wasn't on the leash in the ground but he was and so they had been playing in the middle of the night oh no it wasn't even in the morning it was when we got home from the trunk or treat thing and um he uh they were playing and they were running around the deck and just following each other. And we came home, my brother took out the garbage and when he walked out, he saw Cosmo hanging from his leash and he had died and had hanged himself on uh. Halloween night. And that was horrifying as a child, mm -hmm. but it gets worse because oh. it was that night I, because I was in such a panic, but um, I walked, I was so weirded out and I couldn't sleep and I was, I was a kid. And so like late at night, I heard some noises at the door and I went downstairs. And so our door, there was the big door. And then there were on either side, we have those windows, right? And I, go in, and I look outside that window and right in front of me, moving as I move, a face followed me there. And we made eye contact. Oh, have that. Oh, and, and no, I was sir. terrified. But <laughs> even my child mind goes, it was probably my reflection. I was just looking at myself, but it had a, a different coloring than me. And I was like, I'll, let me check. And so I looked back out there and there was nothing there. My reflection wasn't looking back at me. And I was like, I hate Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I shouldn't think... have, I should invite you to go trick or treating tomorrow. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I think I'm, I think I'm okay. But all I'm saying is this is a very densely packed time of darkness and Absolutely. you have to have to know that pray about it and be aware of it. Um, Absolutely. So Ryan has um, a request from, from you, for you to ask me a question. Okay. I guess ask you how many horror movies you watched. How many horror movies have you watched recently? 89. This wow. is my fault. 89. <laughs> <laughs> so I started in 2017. I started a horror movie uh, challenge. It is still the largest horror movie challenge on the internet. It's called The 100 Nights of Horror. And from July 23rd to Halloween night, you watch 100 movies. Uh, leading up to Halloween night, I never get more than like 30 in before I drop off because it's like, who could watch a hundred horror movies in a row? But then right. Cam is like, I'm totally <laughs> going to do it. And like, um, so I feel bad about it. Um, I'm sorry, Cam. Um, normally I put a lot of uh, really B movies on there, like really silly movies. We had King of the Tarantulas with uh, William Shatner one year and like, you know, oh my but gosh. Cam, Cam went through and picked like a bunch of like really solid, decent horror movies. So I, uh, I'm sorry, but you did this to yourself in, in a way, sir. The worst but one also so far. So I'll, I'll, I will tell you the, the, I'll tell you the three worst that I've watched so far. Um, and it's in no particular order. They're all kind of worst. How kind of, like scariest? Um, well, not scariest, unnerving, um, horrible mm -hmm. to watch. Mm -hmm. And in, in like, a well-made way, not like William Shatner bad. Um, but so take all the wing. King, so King the of the Tarantulas one, is amazing. Do not be smirch it. The, Go ahead. the first one is actually it. is actually Duel, which is um, uh, Ari Aster's films, the um, Midsummer and um, Hereditary. Those are horrifying mm. to watch, um, but I've seen those before. But the ones from this year. One of them was called Possessor, which is that by was Gwen's movie, David right? Cronenberg's son Brandon. Horrifying. Let's go, Brandon. Um, and then the other one was one I watched, I want to say yesterday, called Martyrs, which is a French film from 2008. Don't watch it. The French are messed up in every way. Don't watch I it. say this as a French descendant. The French are messed up people. Don't watch their horror movies. <laughs> Just with la zone fee. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, Doesn't that mean I'm a little girl? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Do you guys remember Muzzy? Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. like Muzzy. That yeah. was the commercial. Was like, just be lazy. Now that's not these. That's oh. French. They're speaking. These children aren't French. They're American. This is right. Muzzy. Yeah. Um, whatever. Um, so. Um, I had something there. It went. I don't know what it was. It must not have been important. <laughs> the Halloween to me all the time. Halloween. Yeah. Let's let's talk about this this era just a bit. Do you have any insight of this time or any anecdotes from people who've had issues with it at all? No, honestly, no. Um, I I do feel the tenseness of the spiritual environment. And I think a lot yeah. of people do. Um, mm -hmm. But I've never had like the the thing that ticks up for me at Halloween is people thinking they're possessed or being asked to be on like be interviewed. Uh, that right. typically picks up at Halloween. Um, so that's my experience with Halloween. But I've never had any like terrible Halloween experiences or dealt with anyone who has that I know of anyway, unless I didn't include it in the 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 discussion I was having with them. So, but yeah, it's there's all kind of bad stuff happening, uh, and Halloween is a huge front for that. Um, you know, like you were saying earlier, Satan, like real Satanism is real, like terrifying people sacrifice and uh, children stuff like that's not garbage that actually happens. And the church of Satan does. It's like Satan's buffer against him being discovered fully, if you will, because uh, he gives it that benign, like cheesy, like you said, atheist with flair. But yeah. That typically ticks up. People are more interested in going to like graveyards at night at Halloween or doing seances or whatever. Um, right. You know, but I've never personally seen it. But yeah, always be on your guard against that stuff because it is out there. I mean, it really is. I think it was auspicious or is it inauspicious or auspicious? I never know the difference between those two. But um, that my priest picked October 31st to be my date of chrismation. That's the day I'm being That's confirmed in the church. And I thought that's perfect because Halloween has always been a special day to me. And now what will make it special is that I'm entering the church of Christ. And that's the first Sunday that I'm going to take communion. And mm -hmm. um, so it's actually going to become like really meaningful and in a very good way. And it's no longer going to carry any of these like dark spiritual trappings that it once right. carried because now it's going to be the anniversary of my confirmation into the church. And so I was really appreciative that he picked that day. And, um, my, I remember I was telling my aunt about it and she goes on Halloween. I was like, yeah. And she goes, isn't on the holiday. I'm like, is it a holiday? Is it really? Holiday. Yeah. <laughs> nah, come on. <laughs> that's, a little, that's a little fast and loose with that word. And I was like, you don't get it off of work. And she's like, that's a good point. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I think that maybe a good thing to do would be, um, to kind of talk about some of the pitfalls that Christians and others have when it comes to the concept of exorcism, that it comes with spiritual warfare in general. Uh, what is some, some things that may be blind spots for us that may be, um, Ooh, that's a good we one. should, we should look, look out for, or things that we should be doing to protect ourselves more. So I think within, and again, I, I say it a lot, Western culture, Western Christianity, American Christianity, because that's our experience, right? Like that's where we are. Um, there are two, two typical extremes that I see. There's the doctrine of cessationism, mm -hmm. uh, which says there, it's almost like a Sadducee belief, like nothing supernatural happens anymore. Like right. um, nothing no spiritual. More spirit. Yeah. No more like, um, yeah, well, and the churches of Christ, the, the the group that I'm part of, that's a big component of our faith. Is a lot of people believe, at least used to, in cessationism, um, and so um, that causes a blind spot because you're being attacked spiritually and you refuse to. It's literally a blatant denial of reality, um, and it leads to a whole lot of spiritual casualties. Um, so it is real. It did not end. It, it until Jesus returns, there is a spiritual war. Uh, it's already won. But it's not stopping. Like um, yeah. demons are terrorists, basically. Yeah, we're in the here but not yet thing. Um, yeah. So that's one thing is the 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 belief that there is nothing supernatural that happens. Um, 
that demons don't exist anymore. They were, you know, a lot of people attempt to demythologize like the New Testament and stuff. And what's interesting yeah. about Paul is that he doesn't do that. Like if anybody was going to demythologize, you know, anything, it would be Paul. Paul does not do that. Um, mm -hmm. Paul doesn't talk mm -hmm. a whole lot about demons particularly um, as much as like Jesus or some of the other writers, but he, none of the New Testament writers demythologize it. Um, so we can't buy into that. Like it still happens. It's real. Um, so don't pretend it doesn't because just putting your head in the sand makes you a bigger target for it Yeah. Um, because you're going to deny it, right? Like the other extreme is, and I don't, I, again, I don't know how to say this way. Let's call it the more charismatic branch of Christianity. Um, I don't want to offend anybody in the audience if that's you. Um, but I was raised that, charismatic. Okay. Um, <laughs> but that believe everything is an unclean spirit. Uh, they believe like a spirit of unemployment um, or a spirit of plantar fasciitis or, uh, you know, the, the, My those kind of got things. That. Oh, yeah, me too. Um, but like... <laughs> Um, like they have these exorcism ceremonies, like in the, in the church, the town I grew up in, there was a church that did Holy spirit happy hour. That's what it was called. And they, you'd walk in, they'd give you a bucket and you would get so drunk off the spirit that you would vomit up anything unclean. Um, and they would like do the, you know, slap the hands on you, knock you over. There was vomit everywhere. And it was gross, very traumatic. Um, so I think thinking that everything, like the thing I like to say is Satan, is not behind every rock. He's behind every other one. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's like there are things. So you can either completely ignore it or take it to where you almost become polytheistic in your life, believing that every little thing is yeah. trying to possess you or has, you know, you divinize what you fear, right? Like, so, uh, you know, a spirit of unemployment or of, of you know, a spirit of, you know, being a neo-fascist liberal or something, whatever they come up with nowadays. The, the, those, those are the things. Those are the two extremes. Like either Satan does nothing, it doesn't exist, or he does everything and Satan controls everything. It's almost like elevating him to like this godlike equal. Hmm. Um, yeah. And that's, and, and you know, so I think it makes a mockery like when you have like, like anytime somebody is like, I'm going to watch the history channel or the travel channel or whatever and, this guy's going to do an exorcism at midnight on Halloween. I'm like, this is going to be garbage. Um, yeah. You know, because it's, it's, it's a lot of times people making a mockery of it, it just, you know, trying to make sense of misfortune that just sometimes happens through our own crappy mm -hmm. choices. It doesn't mean I'm possessed by a spirit. It doesn't mean that, you know, it's, there's always something supernatural that's just trying to, you know, spike me over the volleyball net and take me out. Right. Like, um, so we can either believe everything is caused like I am. And, and in that realm, you become not responsible for your actions in a way, if yeah. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's always someone else's fault, right? Like it's always something I didn't do that because it was me. I was, I had a spirit of adultery, you know, like, no, you, yeah. you had, you cheated on your spouse. That's not a spirit. That's you being a jerk. Right. Um, you know, and, and certainly demonic stuff can play into all these things. And, and again, this is a whole like complex issue, but those are the yes. two extremes to watch out for. Don't think it doesn't happen, but don't believe every single thing happens, uh, is, is caused by a malevolent entity. Um, that's out to just destroy you. Um, right. yeah, surely that they do want to destroy you, but sometimes you just make crappy decisions. Yeah. Sometimes that it's was... not spiritual warfare. It's your own crappy decisions. Yeah. It's like, uh, I, I always bristle when someone says everything happens for a reason because they mean it in a way that, because I'm like, yes, everything happens for a reason. Most of the time it's because you made a stupid choice. Yes. Preach it. Um, yeah. yeah. So, and then, so I guess what we, you know, again, the thing is just have a good prayer life, cultivate alone time, like, uh, with God, cultivate self-care. Self-care is not a luxury. It is it's a necessity. I mean, the right. past two years uh, of living, you know, I'm everybody's sick of living through unprecedented times. Right. Um, so I just think of the Dave Chappelle meme. <laughs> you got any more of those precedented times, um, <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, it's it's like 
we're like in this state uh we're watching the world collectively like polarize and deny reality on two different fronts basically uh, yeah. and then we've all been isolated we've all have a mental health crisis and we all are suffering from like collective ptsd um mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. um and so there is an ele a huge element of spiritual warfare on a national local individual level that's playing off of all this but ultimately just be vigilant like take care of yourself like you have to you can't pour out from an empty cup so if you're spiritually drained i was just thinking you're not, that you're not going to help anybody like yeah. so many of us like busyness is like this virtue and i think that's a form of idolatry no it's not like busyness yeah. is killing you productivity is, is not your goal um, god does not call you to be the most productive being on the planet he calls you to be his child like so walk with him and sometimes that walk means to be very countercultural. keep sabbath you know not in the levitical sense but take time for you and god to delight in in that and take time for yourself guard your heart for out of it flows the wellspring of life that's the point that's very Thanks. interesting because i was very much imbued with this um i almost want to call it like puritanical puritan protestant type work ethic that if I'm not working, I'm not pleasing God. Like yeah. work, work pleases God. And that's, you know, if I don't do my chores or something like that, I feel like I've, I've sinned, I've done wrong. And I know that that's cultural. I know that that's not spiritually I mean, correct. Paul, but Paul's theology of work and like vocation is important because yeah, everything we do is for God, right? Whether it's a yeah. job or digging a ditch or folding clothes, we should, we should do it as we're doing it for God. But you are not, you know, Pete Scazzaro um, has this saying that our culture has made us into to, um, humans doing instead of humans being. Yeah. Uh, th this this reminded me of something that uh, I actually messaged to Jessica early today, earlier yeah. today. Uh, John Foreman from Switchfoot, uh, who is I want to talk to on my show, like he, one of my, I don't, I don't do the hero worship thing, but if I was going to say I had one, he was one of them for sure. Uh, but he did a, an AMA on Reddit a couple years ago and someone asked him, what keeps you going every day? Did you ever feel like giving up along the way? And he said, I get discouraged sometimes, just like everyone. I question whether my music life work matters at all. The danger is letting other people def define your soul's worth. Sometimes folks will like what you do. Other times they'll hate it but I continually remind myself that I do not matter as a result of what I do. I matter because of who I am. I am not a human doing, but a human being. I matter simply mm -hmm. because I was made in the image of the unmade maker and I am loved by love. Absolutely. And you have no idea Ooh. how badly I needed to hear that this week because like things have been tough for me as I have mentioned. And um, I, there have been a couple of days that I didn't get the dishes done. I didn't get the laundry done. And that kind of like weighed heavily on me. Like, oh, I'm really, really dropping the ball here. And then it's like, no, you know, that's not your worth. Your worth is not completely made up of how often you do the dishes. And right. I don't know. I just like really, really needed to hear that that week. This week uh, I, that's a huge component of spiritual warfare is finding your true identity in Christ. Yes. Like, you know, there's like this whole, like, you know, Christian manhood or masculinity or Christian womanhood. It's like, mm -hmm. no, don't, don't, don't be like a Christian woman or a Christian, be like Jesus. That's your yeah. definition. Like if, if it comes from, if you can't be comfortable in your own skin and who you are, that Jesus died for the real you and you continue to pile on this idolatrous, like performance based life worth thing, you're, you're going to be in for a, a wild ride of spiritual warfare. That's much more aggravated than a lot of people because you're trying. Thomas Merton is one of my um, favorite people in the world. Um, he's obviously he's dead, but um, he's got this whole thing about finding your true self. And he was a monk, um, a, a Catholic monk, but uh Basically, the, the, the biggest takeaway from him that I took and how this relates to spiritual warfare, exorcism, demonic possession, whatever, is you. we often place so many layers and pressures upon ourselves from other people or ourselves that we become someone that God does not know because God did not create that person. Like, that'll rock your world. Wow. I never knew you. Yeah. Uh, like, you create a person that God did not when you give in to others' demands and pressures. And God does not recognize that person because that is not who God created. 
You have yep. made yourself into an idol or a or or something to be worshipped or something to be desired or something that thrives on power or money. You have bought into the system of Babylon that is running the world until the end of time, right? Like you are wholeheartedly deep into being spiritually beaten down and afflicted because you have just denied your own existence in a sense. And that's, yeah. that's um, a huge component of spiritual war. Like your worth comes from nothing other than Christ and that you are enough and that he makes you everything you need. That's it. Yeah. There's nothing, nothing else. Yeah. Nothing else matters. Um, I do think that it was when you were talking, cause I, I've, I've said before the idea that, uh, you know, Satan's two, two of his biggest lies were, either that he's behind behind every bush or not behind a bush at all. So, I mean, I, I was, I was kind of heading in that direction when you were going that way as well. But the, the concept of deifying the Satan, the enemy is very prevalent in American Christianity. Like oh yeah. They, and so, and, and when you were talking about that, I wrote this down I, because it's, it's a dualist thought. It's like Zoroastrianism. Yeah, it um, is. It's yin and yang. Yeah. And uh, I wrote down Christian dualism is not Christianity. No, no, and, it is not. And so one of the things that I want to make sure that people know is that, yes, these are spiritual powers that we're fighting and they are powerful. But like you said before, and, and I'm going to use a curse word because I feel like I need to. I love cursing the devil. Um, but people need to realize that compared to Jesus and the authority that he gave us through his name and through his work, uh, Satan's a little bitch. And, I mean, and he literally eats poop act, acting, <laughs> acting like he's anything else is a mistake Oh wow! and not living in that identity. And like I've said millions of times before this generation in particular, and the one following us, it, it suffers from a profound lack of identity. Absolutely. And that there's only one identity worth going for. And if you do so, the enemy's a little bitch. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like Satan is not, that's I, even with church people who've been Christians longer than I've been alive. Right. Like, it's like, no, Satan is not a co-equal to God. Like yeah. not even a little bit. Like he is dead. Like he is a wounded animal. Revelation 12 says he is threat. Woe to you heavens and earth for Satan has come down to you. And he knows his time is short. Right. Like he's a wounded animal. And right uh, now it, he's flailing. Yes. He's, he's lashing out. Because he has been defeated by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, um, and so, you know, the the Christ is the the ultimate thing, and and you know, um, that's that's the thing when I I walk into an exorcism, it's like I can maybe God can use me to help you, but if if you're not going to submit your life to Christ, you may end up in worse shape than you are now, yeah. like you know, and that's that's part of it. That's why I said earlier, uh, you know paranormal and you know spiritual demonic experiences are very powerful apologetics um but again yeah you know, there's so much distortion of the truth out there i mean you have the whole paranormal community um that's just nuts um, i think i think aliens are a deception to point away from god and to point to science yeah and, and even if say like aliens are real right I don't care. Who God cares? told humans what to do. <laughs> like, oh, you know, right. <laughs> like Jesus told me what to do and you and gave us humans that. So if aliens show up and everybody's like, Oh, your faith's dead and they're alien. No, I don't, I don't care. I don't, you discover yeah. Sasquatch. Good for you. Um, I mean, it may just be <laughs> me with a shirt off on vacation, but yeah. um, you know, if you find it's, Thor, it's, it's just, it's just me. Yeah. I mean, very much. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> so also let me, I don't know how much, how much time do we have left? We, we, we've got uh, a couple more minutes. minutes. Um, so, all I was going to say real quick was that if anyone is interested in, in searching for God and in searching for Jesus and want someone to walk side by side with them and help them, uh, you can tweet at me. I'm sure Scott is just as open to that as I am. Absolutely. Uh, Jessica and I are working together on that. So if you're interested in that, that journey, come to me, come to Scott, 
we'll walk you we'll we'll walk with you uh I, yeah. and i know that ryan and cody both who came on the show last week are in the same boat so absolutely we're on a journey together come to us we want to do this thing so go ahead sorry so what was i guess what i because everybody wants to know like you know um what how is exorcism like as portrayed in hollywood right like yes yeah that's a good um, one. yes so hollywood actually believe it or not does an okay job most of the time um about it because here's why the roman catholic church is probably one of the greatest record keepers of all times and so there's so much information about exorcism for centuries and how it developed into the roman rituale the 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 official orthodox or the roman catholic rite of exorcism um <laughs> and so you know but the idea like the movie the exorcist like uh you know people's heads spinning around shooting out pieces that's not gonna happen um no. at least i haven't seen now i've seen people levitate <laughs> I've seen people throw up glass who have been witchcraft, put, you know, hexed. Um, I've seen people throw up uh, metal. Um, I've seen you know, terrible things happen. Um, so, you know, there are elements. I've been in rooms where the temperature, it was 80 degrees outside of a no air conditioned room and it dropped to 31 degrees in less than a second. Um, you know, I've seen people speak in multiple voices at the same time. And in different languages um so hollywood does okay but they try and sex it up a lot if that's the right term especially um, in the movie the exorcist oh my well, god well the exorcist movie is the book is better but it's actually based on a true story um that happened in st louis except in, it, it was a, a boy instead of a girl right so and it all started with a ouija board and all that so a lot of the things that happened in the movie the exorcist are actually factually documented yeah um you know, and that was the goal when William Peter Blady, Blatty wrote that um, was to show God's power in an age of like increased occultism and stuff. And then they turned it into the movie and and whatever. But um, another one that's really important in exorcism, I guess, ideology or understanding is the exorcism of Emily Rose. Um, yeah, that movie scared the pants off of me. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, so that's based on a story of a girl in Germany in the 70s, I believe. Her name was Annalise Michael. Um, and here's where her story is weird, because she had an, a legitimate medical condition plus demonic possession. Um, she had temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, so that's mm -hmm. when you have a lesion on your temporal lobe. And that actually, in and of itself, can cause auditory, uh, visual, tactile um, hallucinations. Um, voices, Quick seeing thing. things. Oh, um, my gosh. And so it's kind of a learning tool because the priest who conducted that exorcism um, ha went to jail uh, because they killed her uh, not by actually murdering her, but they took her off her medicine um, mm -hmm. and she died as a result of that. The other pro thing we look at as a case study in that, and, and the movie is pretty, pretty good and accurate uh, uh, as far as a lot of the things go. Um, but where the priest went wrong there and why this is a case study is because they did the thing you don't do whenever you're dealing with a demonic entity. They decided to have a conversation with it. Mm. Um, and so you never, I, I mean, you don't do that. Uh, you don't talk to them. You don't acknowledge them. You just go with the prayers. Like, but they decided it'd be a great idea to have a conversation with this thing. Uh, and it got worse and worse and worse. And she died because of it. Um, mm. So, you know, it's a terrible thing um and you can look up the audio from that those cases and the court cases absolutely terrifying stuff like horror movies can't make that stuff up um the voices the the latin chanting the uh you know terrible things happening um so hollywood gets a lot of things right but like you know spinning your bones around and like walking upside down like a spider you know that's creepy and all but that ain't happening um yeah you know Man. things happen i i mean I know of a, a guy who was doing an exorcism and an entire dresser hit him in the face, lifted up off the ground. Bam! Ouch. Um, <laughs> you know, just boom. Um, you know, there's also times where houses have caught on fire during an exorcism. Um, you know, there's times where people, um, you know, do vomit. Uh, there's cursing and it, it's, it's a very scary place. And that's why, um, you know, I'm glad Jesus is more powerful than that. But, yeah. you know, so so watching the demonic, like the conjuring and all that stuff, all those, those are based on true stories. 
Um, but again, based on it's really Annabelle's a true story, um, you know, all that stuff. But you know, it, it, it's sexed up a lot for Hollywood, and an exorcism mm -hmm. typically is not like a one shot deal, it takes a long time. Sometimes it could take months or years, uh, multiple sessions in some cases. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, those are some of kind of like the, the facts versus reality of it all. Awesome. It led me to think that I could be walking through my house at midnight to go get a glass of water and then, you know, something just bam is going to take me over and I've got yeah. no control over that whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Not <laughs> just vampires. You got to invite them in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, so. I don't want none of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. And kids yeah. listening, do not play with Ouija boards. It's yeah. not a toy. <laughs> what like, do you do with one if you have one? Throw it away. Which did you? But okay, so I've thought about that. Like, it, you throw it away. It's in a bag, but it's still intact. Is it okay, not better it, maybe to burn it? Give it to your priest. He'll know what to do. Oh, with interesting. It. Okay. Interesting. I would like show up and hey, Father, happy birthday! <laughs> like, yeah, I wonder what he's gonna say when I show up with that. I thing. mean, ask, give him some warning because maybe he'll be like, I don't know what to yeah. do. With it. But ultimately, you want to get dispose of it, um, bury it's burn like, it, it's, you know, salt the earth. Right. I'm just kind of like wondering what to do with it because I thought about burning it, and then I'm like, does that not? I don't know. That seems like inviting. Sometimes too. burning can be bad. It's just dependent on yeah. dealing with witchcraft or just, you know, you know, there's so, voodoo, anything like that. It's, it's difficult. We, we bought it probably, what am I, 38 now? So early 20s, you know, at some point we had like a seance party. Of course. And right, because that's what you do around Halloween, right? right? And it's, right. Li it's literally a Parker Brothers Ouija board. Right. It it's got like glow in the dark stuff on it. Um, so we had this seance, nothing seemed to happen. And then at the very end of it, I kid you not, despite all of my atheism and scientific minded, I invoked the name of Jesus Christ because I knew that was the only thing that could really shut the door. Just mm -hmm. in case we'd opened a door, I wanted to make sure we shut that door too. So I invoked the name of Jesus Christ. Um, so I think that that worked, but I still have the damn thing. I don't know what to do with it. Evan said, throw it away. I said, a kid could find it. Could fall out of the trash bag, fall onto the road. A kid could get it. Well, burn it. Well, I don't know. Burning, then you've got like a, a smoke fume. And is it not inviting to spirits to like burn things? Isn't that why we burn incense? And like, I don't I mean, know. It just seems like. Not the so thing. Basically, the only solution is a tactical nuclear strike from a satellite. That's what you <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Got all no, kinds of bad different. access. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's just one of those things like get rid of it. I like, would burn it. Burn it. Um, then bury the ashes under the ground. Yeah. Uh, and pray that Jesus breaks its power. Like, I'll, I, I'm weird. I'll go through toy stores and lay my hands on the little Ouija boards and, and pray that Satan's power be broken on them. I you know, it's just the game. No. My wife had a it's random not. pack of tarot cards when we got married, and I blessed, I prayed over them, put some uh oil, uh, anointed them with oil, and said, You're done. And let me tell you, I totally have tarot cards too. <laughs> that stuff is gone now. Thank the Lord. <sighs> yeah, um, but yeah, so we are nearing. Well, we're at we're 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 at the end. This is this is typically where we end. This is so, the end. So before before we it's go, a good song. Um, now I have that other song stuck in my head. It's the end of the world as we know it. Um, cool. but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel fine. Like that's yeah, great. <laughs> Either um, way, we win, man. Right. Uh, so what we typically do at the end of the show is we are. A, um, a podcast of hope and we we know the ultimate hope but not everyone does and sometimes they need little aspects little silver linings of hope to keep them going so we like to ask some the people who come on um, what is something in your life it could be global local state level personal what is something that gives you hope and motivation to carry on that you would like to share with the audience and give them a little hope on the way out. 
I mean, there's so much, and I don't want to give like the token Christian answer. Um, but like, just despite the terrible situation our world is in right now, just seeing people be decent human beings, um, yeah. in a time where most aren't, that gives me hope. And uh, like, my church family oh is my just God. huge, and and just seeing like just random acts of kindness happening in the midst of this crazy chaos that we find ourselves in, especially over the past couple years. Um, so just seeing that as giving it, because there's so much bad in the world, but there's so much more good. Like God did not create the earth and to, to abandon it. it. He said it is very good. And he called people very good. And so, yeah, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God, but people still have goodness in there. And it's like, yeah, I feel like Samwise Gamgee. I mean, there's, oh. good in this world. there's good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for, right? Like, that, that's it. <laughs> he hates Sean Astin so much. But you got to like Samwise if you can just divorce I, that. I'm so, I'm personally mad at Sean Astin. Is it, why? Because of Stranger <laughs> Things there's or what? There's beef. No, there's real life beef between these two men. Um, so uh, <laughs> to put it to put it shortly, um, I love Lord of the Rings. Probably my favorite movies ever made. Um, but I met Sean Astin one time on a film set. I was supposed to be a featured extra. I was supposed to be a biker. I had my motorcycle. Short version. He, I let him ride it for a minute. He dropped it and then pretended that he didn't. Where'd he and go, so, Rudy? He, this 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 little nerd dropped my motorcycle, and uh, he not only drops <laughs> eaves, he drops motorcycles. So yikes! To heck with Sean Aston. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, 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 I know he's actually Christian, so we'll see him in the end, and we'll we'll reconcile. I know. <gasps> you have Absolutely. to forgive yeah, Cam. You have to forgive Sean Aston. How about Dem Apples? Uh, but it's not fun to not hate Sean Aston. It's right. purely for show. It's purely for show. It's speculatory. Um, yeah, but yeah. That's 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 a great answer. Um, people, I I love to see people be decent. It's it's exciting when they are. Um, Make America kind again. Mm, yes, I love that. But, oh my gosh, think, I love I that. I do think um, kindness is in desperate need because niceness is everywhere and niceness yeah. is it's fake. deceptive and um ineffectual and awful and we need we need to learn how to be kind again and we need to learn right. i've said this so many times we need to learn how to lift each other up uh, right and so we'll talk again and at that point Absolutely. i'll ask you what your favorite thing is about me but i don't think you know me well enough to answer that question yet <laughs> it's your luscious hair that's what I. Oh I, man! Because I, I, I don't have any. Typically. I'm jealous. <laughs> I don't have any. <laughs> uh, I, but I have to be honest, you guys. This was a really fruitful discussion for me personally. Like, I I really appreciated this talk we had today. I've yeah. had a blast. You guys are awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I I appreciated you coming on. And what's what I'll, I'll have to tell you the um behind the scenes story of kind of how this came to be. Um, because there was some weird stuff that happened, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, if you want to hang out, I'm going to tell them where to find you. All I have is your Twitter. So you'll have to tell me if there's anything else that you want them to find. Um, and then I'll go through our stuff. If you'd like to hang out and talk with us directly afterwards, feel free to hang around. If not, you can pop out. Um, but if you want to talk to Scott on Twitter, you can find him at Scott Johnson 15 I recommend finding a way to get rid of those numbers. But for now, that's what you type in. Uh, is there anywhere else uh, you want people to find you? I hate Facebook. And so no. Me too. Okay. Um, awesome. <laughs> I mean, Twitter's not any better, but at least it's not Facebook. So, it's but thank point. you guys for having me. Thank you very much. Thank and, you. I, I'll come talk about anything with you guys. You're good people. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. But I will hang um, out and I'm going to go pee. Okay, cool. I'll, I'll pull you out so you can That's pee. That's usually my ending line, spot. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back. See you in a minute. All right. All right. And for the rest of you, we still have one more October spooky season episode left, which is a very exciting one uh, because we're having Chris Date from Rethinking Hell coming on the show. He is a very interesting character. 
uh, and uh, he has been studying the Bible deeply, particularly studying hell and how it looks biblically and the the misconceptions that American Christians and Christians all over the world have about it. Uh, so we're going to be talking about hell next week, and then we start moving into November. And November is a super interesting one. I can't wait to tell you about the very last one in November, but I'll just tell you quickly the three coming up beyond him. First off, we have Dr. Robert Hayes, who is a professor of nuclear engineering and also a Christian uh, who I found on TikTok, and I was just fascinated by him. And so we're going to talk to him. I will probably talk to him about nuclear science, some about being Christian in the uh, Darwinian world of science um, and go from there. Um, after that, we have Dr. Rebecca Simon coming on, who has a PhD in p the history of pirates. And so we're going to talk about pirates. Uh, and I'm excited about that because I like pirates. Yo, and ho, ho, ho. Right after that, we have, uh, it actually could have been a This Month episode. Um, doc I'm going to call her Dr. Kate Cheryl. She came on and we, she talked to, to us about death previously. And she mm -hmm. studied uh, uh, Gothic literature. And so she's going to come on and talk about the spiritualist movement in the Victorian era. And we're going to, we're going to chat about that. Uh, beyond that, first off, hit the like button, hit subscribe, help us build so that we can get, go further. We can reach more people and uh, we can maybe get monetized and pay for this thing a little more easily someday. Um, but beyond that, if you want to follow me on Twitter at Cam Harless, very simple. It's my name. If you'd like to follow Jessica here, your favorite 12th century peasant. You can follow her at Soup Canarchist <laughs> on Twitter. It's soup season, so she's more alive than ever. Um, if you <laughs> would like to support us directly, uh, the best way to do that is on our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash the mad ones. Uh, if you join Patreon, you get our entire back catalog. So that's that will now be 114 episodes. You'll be able to see my evolution from starting. You'll be able to see mine and Jessica's uh, coming together and making a new show and our, our evolution from there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we all, we're also on Rockfin. And uh, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out some, some different exclusive stuff to do there. But Rockfin is just another good place. We're on Odyssey. All of these links are, in, are below. Um, you can also get a t-shirt. We have some cool t-shirts. Jessica, I'm going to make a Christmas shirt. I'm going <gasps> to do that this week. Oh, I'm going to make a Christmas shirt. So oh, I'm so excited. We, we love are the Christmas. Mad ones. I love Christmas. We are the mad ones. Oh, December is going to be interesting. It's going to be very going to be lit. Um, but we are the, we are the mad ones.com slash store. You can listen to us on any podcatcher. You can listen to us, to us on our website directly. Um, if you'd like to watch youtube.com slash the mad ones, if you're listening right now, you could be looking at Jessica this whole time and you're really missing out. Um, <laughs> I think that's about all that I have to tell you. Any last words for the, for the, for the audience? Not really. Nope. I have to pee too. So, <laughs> <laughs> so with that dear audience, you have, you have the ability to be a light in this world. So go light it up. Thank you.